something to look forward to there. Okay, so last time we talked about net present value and what did we say the rule is here? I mean it's up there. When, for, for homework and exams, what should you always do? We should accept all projects. Yeah, all, all positive MPB projects. Now, um, what did we say about, and that's, that's great for all your assignments, what about the real world? Should we accept all positive MPB projects? No. Mm -hmm. Of course, they've got a really tiny positive MPB compared to the initial layout. We know they are budgeting. And so the future cash flows are un truly uncertain. But even the ones right up front are uncertain. And so you might overrun by 10% on your initial investment, and then you'd be in a world of hurt. I told you never to accept a negative MTV project, but I need to tell you the, of course, the exception. And I'll tell you about an example from my own career. I was the manufacturing engineering manager at a factory in Ohio. And we were making metal things that we then painted to keep these metal things from rusting. And so one day I get a call from the front office and they say there's someone here to see you. And so I went up to the front and there stands this little guy and he's like bald, he's got this horseshoe hair, he's got his glasses on the end of his nose and he says, are you the manufacturing engineering manager? I said, yes. He says, I'm from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And I said, go on. He said, I want to look at your paint process. I said, okay. I said, do you have your safety glasses? He said, yes. I said, do you have your steel-toed boots? He said, yes. I said, okay, let's go. And so we head off into the plant, and we go, and we stand close to the paint operation. And here's what he does. He goes, and he looked like some sort of animal sniffing the air. And I said, well, what are you doing? He says, I smell VOCs. I'm like, what's that, voice of Cambodia? And he's like, no, volatile organic compounds. In other words, paint thinner. I'm like, yeah, it's paint. It's got thinner in it. It's, and he's like, you, you can't have that. That's, that's uh, against the law. And I said, why? And then he told me something about the ducks, and I forget. But anyway, he said the ducks. So I'm like, okay, well, we got to save the ducks. Anyway, so I said, well, you know, obviously this is something that you think a lot about. What can I do to bring our painting into compliance? He said, well, there is this operation called powder coating, and it's basically where you hang, bless you, you hang your metal parts on wires and you give them an electrically negative charge. And then there's these tiny little pieces of plastic that you get an electric positive charge in the spray gun. By the way, what happens to negative and positive charges? Attract. Yeah, they, they attract. Okay, so then the powder clings to these um, parts and then they go through an oven that melts the plastic and it creates this really nice paint-like finish and it doesn't apparently do anything bad to the ducts. And I said, okay, that's great. I said, he says, I'll be back in 30 days. Now, what do you think is going to happen if he comes back in 30 days and I don't at least have a plan for what to do? He's from the government. What can he do to me? Shut you down. Yeah, he can shut me down, right? He can shut me down. Now, if he shuts my paint operation down, and that's all he would shut down is my paint operation, I could continue to ship the product out to the customers and we call it, you know, natural or naked or, you know, we, the marketing people would come up with something. By the way, we're making truck suspensions. How well do you think that would go over with the truck suspension crowd? No. And, and why, why do we have to paint these things to begin with? They're going to rust, right? They're going to rust if we don't. Okay, so that means I've got to get my stuff together. And so I do. I uh, sit down and I go through, I learn everything that I can about this powder paint, powder paint. Well, anyway, I get the, the, uh, people, the vendors in and they put quotes and we talk about what kind of cost savings because in fact, there was going to be a cost savings in, as a result of doing this. And it was going to be a whole lot better for our guys because they wouldn't have to wear the heaviest respirators and well, there's all sorts of good stuff. Well, anyway, so uh, I do the, the project up. Uh, and it's still, it's got a slightly negative NPV. 
do you think I still did the project? Yes. Oh, yeah. And so that's when we do our slightly negative, we do negative MPD projects, is that if we don't do them, it'll cut off the rest of our cash flows. For example, uh, how about safety stuff? Does safety stuff typically pay dividends that you can think of? I mean, other than not having to pay for people to get their fingers sewn back on, things like that. But typically, they're going to be negative MPV projects. Do I do them anyway? Absolutely, I do. First of all, it's the right thing to do. Secondly, uh, if I don't, what's the government going to do? You ever heard of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA? Do you think OSHA can shut my operation down if it's not safe? Absolutely, they can. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here was the, the reaction when your phone would ring and they would say, you'd say, well, who is it? And they would say, it's OSHA. OSHA? Right. <laughs> that's, that's the OSHA reaction. Okay, now let's talk about, back, get back to the net prison value. What do we need to do in net prison value? First of all, we need the initial, initial investment amount. We need the future cash flows and their timing. And we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of those future cash flows. Now, why is the timing important? Because we're going to be doing time value of money. We're going to be finding the present value of those future cash flows, and we need to know when they're happening. That's the same reason we need to know the discount rate, because we're going to be finding the present value of those future cash flows. So, this is a really silly, stupid example. We have $100 today. We can either invest the cash to pay a dividend today, uh, or, that should be, or. Okay, so we can either pay a dividend of $100 today, or we can invest it and pay $170 year, one year from now. So that's the idea. So the question is this, what, what's better, 100 a day or 107 one year from now? And they tell us the required rate of return is 6%. And so all I've got to do is find uh, the present value of the future cash flows and add in that initial uh, investment, which of course is negative. And when I do, I see this thing has a positive NPV of 94 cents. Now, under the rules that we've been given, do we accept or reject the project? Yeah, we accept the project. Now, when we do, the question says, what, do we, what does this do for shareholder wealth? What's the goal of financial management, Ms. Wabi? Maximize shareholder wealth. Maximize shareholder wealth. When we do this, we are adding to the shareholder wealth. And in fact, we could say if this company had 94 shares, when we announce this 94 cent positive NPV deal, each share should go up in value by one cent. In theory, that's the way this should work. Now, do we actually see that in reality? First of all, the number that we come up with is a scientific wild ass guess. Secondly, when we make the announcement of it, do you think that the market, uh, both the market at, at large, is going to make the same estimate about the present value, net present value, that we do? No. So I would actually tell you that if you look at the NPV as the, the market figures it out, you're probably better off to think about that one than the one you chose. I'll give you a good example. Has anyone heard of the Metaverse? Mr. Scott, what's the Metaverse? Um, I feel like I'm wrong now because the way you pronounce it's different, but I was Meta. Meta. <laughs> I never met a Metaverse. I didn't like Go ahead. Okay, Facebook. Just... Yeah, okay. So Facebook, they come out and uh, you know what Facebook is. Your grandma's on it. Um, so Facebook is all about, you know, this social thing. And Mark... Zuckerberg says that's not the future. What does he say the future is? VR. Yeah, VR, which stands for virtual reality. Virtual reality. He says instead of my mom and all of her friends trading pictures of their flowers on Facebook, why can't they all just put on these goggles? Which, by the way, try explaining to an 81 year old how to use mm -hmm. VR goggles. But they're all going to put on these goggles and they can tour each other's flower gardens virtually. Right? And they can sit around and have virtual coffee and, and you know, virtual gossip and all that. Well, anyway, so here's the interesting thing. 
Mark, Egghead, he makes the big announcement, oh, we're going all in on the metaverse. What's happened to Facebook stock price since then? It's had a little rough stock. <laughs> Way down. The market knew that this thing was not viable. <coughs> By the way, how many active users do you think Metaverse has? As of the last time, like a couple of weeks ago? 37. <laughs> there are 37 active users. First of all, you gotta spend like $2,000 to $5,000 on one of these VR headsets. Secondly, you have to be willing to look like a total tool to everyone around you, right? Because you've got this thing on your head. So I'm assuming this is for lonely people that are at home by themselves. Anyway, but hey, people who are home by themselves, do you really want to spend time with them? There's probably a reason they're having to hang out in a home by themselves, right? They're probably mean. And so you would you want to encounter them in a virtual cafe? No, they might throw virtual coffee at you. Who knows? So long story short, do you think if Mark Zuckerberg was maximizing shareholder wealth, do you think he would stick with this metaverse, metaverse plan? No, he dumped that thing and says, yep, sorry about that. We found out it's bad for children and small animals, so we're shutting it down. Or, you know, make some good excuse so he doesn't look like a total moron. But instead, what's he doing? He's doubling down, right? Okay. So let's ask the three questions. And if you recall, last time we said, we're going to ask these three questions. And if we can say yes to all three questions, it's going to be a three-star measure. There is no chance to get star four or five. Three is the most you can get. And let's start asking these questions. Number one, does NPV account for the time value of money? It has to. It has to. How? Because we are discounting it. Uh, yeah, he says we're discounting those future cash flows uh, at a rate appropriate to the risk. We'll get to that in a minute. So yes, so number one is yes, so one star so far. Does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? <clears throat> Ms. Volkova, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? She says yes, she's right. How? Uh, she doesn't know. So does anyone want to back clean up here? It's like we're using the rate uh, of the, the... Yeah, rate. we've picked a rate that's appropriate to the risk of those cash flows. So that's how we're accounting for the riskiness. So, so far, two stars. <laughs> and finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Absolutely. Uh, dollars and cents. It gives us, of course, it's a swag, but it gives us a swag of the dollars and cents created by the project. So, all three are yes. This is a three star measure. So, Therefore, we're going to declare NPV our gold standard. It's what we're going to compare all these other things to to see how well they do the job. NPV works every time. Now, I have to put a caveat in there. Have you ever heard the expression garbage in, garbage out? Yeah. So if you're putting in garbage in here, you're going to get garbage back out. So assuming you've got good solid numbers, your swags are within reason, then NPV should work. Questions? Okay. Now we're gonna go from the most complex one to the actual simplest one, and that is the payback period. The payback period is the amount of time it takes for a project to break even. Well, what do we mean by break even? That's for it to get enough cash flows, positive cash flows, to exceed, actually to get, uh, to, to match the amount of the initial investment. That's when we get enough positive cash flows to match that initial outflow. And so when it hits zero, we're gonna say we, we have broken even, and then if we make more than that, we've more than broke even. So how do we calculate it? Where we're gonna add, we're gonna add those future cash flows back to the original negative cash flow until we hit zero. So what's our rule? Our rule is accept all projects that pay back on or before an arbitrary cutoff. I'm gonna tell you a couple of things here. Number one, notice this says on or before. On or before. So this is, we're gonna see later, there's another one that's like greater than or equal to. Uh, on or before. And then there's an arbitrary cutoff. What does arbitrary mean? 
Is there a lot of good science behind arbitrary? No. Arbitrary, uh, it, it sounds like we're just randomly picking a number, but that's not truly the case. Well, the person that gets it, so I'll give you an example. 1994, I go to work for Halliburton, uh, vice president of manufacturing, this man named Ed Phipps. If you've ever had an NRI, you can thank Ed Phipps because he was the one that brought that technology to market. He didn't invent it, but he was the, the guy that brought it to market at GE. So Ed's been around for a long time. Ed is uh, is uh, got a pretty good business head on his shoulders, and so we he said the arbitrary cutoff is two years. We're going to explain why two years. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you right now the situation of the company at the time. Uh, at the time, Halliburton had been poorly managed for a very long time, and so people didn't want to loan us money. People didn't want to buy our shares, and so the only thing we had to work with was uh, the internal uh, equity that we could build. In other words, any profit we'd make minus the dividends, so retained earnings, that's what we had to work with. So we could have lots and lots of positive MPV projects, but we couldn't fund them all because we didn't always have funding available. By the way, that's one of the basic assumptions of net present value is that you can always get financing for positive NPV projects. But it turns out there are situations where that's not quite true, and we'll talk about some more of those later on. Okay, so um, that's, that's our arbitrary cutoff, not truly arbitrary. So what do we need for payback? Well, first of all, we need the initial investment amount and the future cash flows and their timing. So far, it's exactly the same things that we needed for NPV. But then we have that arbitrary cutoff, and that is in years. What do we not need for payback that we needed for NPV? Yeah, the, the rate that's according to the risk, right? So that's what we don't need for payback. So here is our first payback example. Our arbitrary cutoff is two years. And so what I would give you on an exam or a homework would just be the first two columns, T and cash flow. And then what I want you to do is create this balance column over to the right. And it's going to be uh, basically the reverse of a checkbook. I sure hope you guys know how to balance a checkbook. Does anyone here? No, don't confess. If you don't know how to balance a checkbook, please come see me before you get yourself in real trouble. So. A checkbook balance, typically what happens is you deposit money in a checking account, like on payday, and so that's a positive, and then as you write checks out, that is negative. In this case, what we're doing is we're putting the big negative up front, that's with our initial investment, and then as cash flows come in, we're recording them as positive. And as soon as that balance gets back to zero, then we have broken even. And so in this case, we have an initial cash flow of 50,000 bucks. We've got a machine we're gonna pay 50,000 bucks for, and so our initial balance is minus 50,000. And then we said in year uh, one that we're gonna get 30,000 uh, cash flow in. And so how do I get the balance for year one? I take that balance of minus 50,000 and I add the 30,000, and now I've got minus 20,000. In the next year, I've got a cash flow coming in of 20,000, and after I add that to the balance of negative 20,000, I get zero. By the way, as soon as we hit zero, we have broken even, right? We don't even have to go on to year three here for payback, <coughs> but we do have a positive cash flow coming in after payback. So that's, we're going to show that's one of the issues with this measure. Okay, now a couple of things. Actually, just one thing here. Um, do we accept or reject? What was the rule? Yeah, we accept if the payback is on or before. On or before. Yeah, the pays back on or before the arbitrary cutoff. Arbitrary cutoff here is two years. It's exactly two years. By the way. Do you think it always comes out this nice and neat? Oh, heck no. Okay, so this is what happens when it's not so nice. Now, 
let's say it's the same machine. I'm going to teach you a little something here about uh, buying machinery. So when I started out at Halliburton, uh, we engineers would figure out what machine we wanted, and we would have to do this MPB analysis, and we would ask uh, the, the machine salespeople, how much? And they would tell us 50,000, and we'd say. And then my boss's boss caught on that we weren't doing this the right way. He says, folks, we have an entire procurement department. What's procurement? It's like buying. Yeah, they're like buyers. In fact, that's the old term. Now they want to be called procurement specialists, but you know, back in the old days, we would have called them buyers. Okay, so, and I'm not kidding, this woman's name was Ramey Dingle. Ramey Dingle. He says, get Ramey to help. And so, we call them Ramey, and she looks at our stuff here, and she says, how much are they asking? And I said, 50,000 bucks, and she says, <laughs> And then uh, she invites the sales guy to come visit with her to negotiate. By the way, do you think he's ever gonna walk out of there with more than 50,000 bucks? <laughs> no way. So it's, it's funny, because Remy was a, a tiny lady, but she gets this guy in the room, and I was actually able to watch her make him sweat. And she walked out of there and she says, 40,000. A conversation saved us 10,000 bucks. By the way, that 10,000 bucks, that's just straight contributes to shareholder wealth, right? Because it's their money that we were wasting. Okay, back to the story. Now we've got, we're only gonna have to spend 40,000 on this. We're gonna get the same cash flows we got before, so that's a pretty good deal. Uh, our initial balance is minus 40,000. After year one, I've got a minus 10,000 balance. How did I get from the year zero balance to the year one balance? Adding the cash flow. Yeah, we just added that cash flow of 30,000. Now, in year two, we're still getting 20,000. And the balance in year two, if I take negative 10,000 plus 20,000, it gives me positive 10,000. Did we ever hit zero? Yeah, somewhere between one and two, right? Do you think, if I ask you on an exam, somewhere between one and two will be one of the answers? No. We have to come up with a decimal. We have to come up with a decimal. And in order to come up with that decimal, we make an assumption. We assume that the positive cash flows coming in are uniform throughout the year. In other words, we're getting the same amount of money every day. By the way, I don't think that's a good assumption for this problem because these things start out making a lot of money and then you see that the amount of money is making tapering off. And so I'll bet we actually pull in more money in the first half of that time period between one and two than we do in the second half. But we don't know for sure. So we're just gonna make the assumption of uniform cash flow. So how do we go about this? We start with the last year with a negative balance. In our case, that is year one. So I'm gonna write down a one. Then I look at how much money do I still owe at that time. Now, the amount of money that you owe is a positive number. I owe 10,000 bucks, so don't get messed up and use a negative here. And then I look at how much money is coming in in the next year. How much money is coming in in the next year after year one? 20,000. 20,000, so I'm gonna divide by 20,000. And this all comes out to be 0 0.5. And so we can say this project is paying back in 1.5 years. So that's how we handled the decimals. That's how we handled the decimals. If I were you, I would write down this little uh, start with the last year's negative balance, that, that little bit right there, because in, in the middle of an exam, you might not remember how this all works. Okay, now the payback period is now less than it was before. Our arbitrary payoff, or our arbitrary cutoff is the same. Do we accept or reject the project? Yeah, we definitely accept the project. It's even better now than it was. Questions? <clears throat> okay, now let's give this thing the stink test. 
Number one, does it account for the time value of money? No, why not? We are not doing anything time. Yeah, we're not doing any discounting. Remember, with, when you look at time value of money, you kind of got to look at when the cash flows happen. In, in our case, we could have had cash flows one and two be reversed, and we would have gotten the same payback. And the, the cash flow time one was larger. And so it doesn't take time value of money into account. So we're going to have to say zero on that one, no star. Uh, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? No. No, man. This could have been either putting an investment in a dairy, which is a place where they milk cows, or in some sort of methamphetamine lab. We just don't know, right? Do you think the riskiness or difference between those two projects? Absolutely. Okay, number three. Does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? No, I guarantee you I can find a discount rate that would make this thing a negative NPV. I guarantee you I can show you a discount rate that would make it a positive NPV. And so since we're not considering the time value of money or the riskiness, there is no way that we can know whether or not this creates uh, wealth. So how many stars does this thing get? Oh, come on. Zero. Zero, right? Okay, now. Problems with payback method. First of all, we've already said it doesn't consider time value of money. And let me show you how dangerous that is. Look at projects A and B. Projects A and B, they've already done the math for you. They pay back in three years. According to the payback rule, both of these projects are identically attractive. Which one would you rather have? B. B, why? Uh, more money sooner. Yeah, you get your money sooner. You get the same amount of money overall, but you're getting the money sooner, and we know time value of money. We'd always rather have money sooner rather than later. Okay, so now that we've got that solved, let's look at uh, projects B and C. They have identical cash flows up to the time of the payback. They have identical paybacks. They're identically attractive. Which one would you choose? Oh, come on. C. Yeah, you choose C. Why? It's more money. It's more money, right? It's, but the problem is this is happening after payback. So this is the second problem with payback is that it ignores the cash flows that happen after payback. Now, to be fair, I was giving this talk to a uh, night class a few years ago, and one of the guys in there was an engineer. And he says, I have never seen a series of cash flows like that. And to be truthful, he's absolutely right. But I said, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen projects that this, the cash flows would, know, we know they will end after a certain number of years versus ones that we know will go on for a long time? And he said, yes. And I said, it's the same, same deal here. What if instead of saying $60,000 in year four, what if we just said on project C that 60 just keeps going over and over and over again? That thing is still going to have more present value of the cash flows than uh, B. And so that's why we say this is a problem because it doesn't account for the cash flows that happen after payback. You can have two identical projects that look fine right up to payback and then they'd be different afterwards and you make a, maybe a bad decision. Okay, question so far. So this thing looks like a dog with fleas. We're saying, wait a minute, doesn't account for the time value of money, doesn't account for risk, and it doesn't account for the cash flows uh, after the uh, payback. It doesn't give us any idea about the well created. It looks like a total piece of junk. Why might we still use it? Well, first of all, it's simple. And for small projects, it might be sufficient. I'll give you an example. Um, the year's 1994. I'm working in a machine shop, Duncan, Oklahoma, and we're making pumps. And one of the parts to the pump, actually a bunch of the parts to the pump, were these little brass rings. And the little brass rings were uh, to basically to keep the fluid from falling out, but you don't even know that. Anyway, so 
little brass rings. And the way you make little brass rings is on a machine called a lathe. A lathe is a machine that makes round things. It spins a piece of metal, and then you carve down the outside of that thing to the correct outside diameter for the rings, and then you use what's called a boring bar, and you bore out the inside to make it the correct diameter for the inside of the rings. And then you use something called a cutoff tool, and you just cut off these rings off of this tube that you've just created. So we're cutting these rings off the tube, and there was a man named Ronnie who would stand there and catch these rings on a hook when they come off. And then he would throw them in a big box. Now, the problem when you machine is that, or one of the problems, is that you end up with something called a burr. A burr. So these machine, these parts come off with a very sharp edge. If you've ever trimmed your fingernails and you feel how sharp they are and you end up injuring yourself in some way, that's like a burr. That's the same thing, but that's the same thing. And so we had another guy, a guy named Ralph. And Ralph, all day long, sat on a stool with what was called a buzz gun, which is just a, a compressed air motor with a long stick and some sandpaper on it. He would go, <laughs> and he would knock all those sharp edges off the parts, one at a time. And that's all he did all day long. We paid Ralph $40,000 a year to do this. And keep in mind, it's 94, so that was actually good money for Duncan, Oklahoma. Okay, one day, Ronnie calls me over and he says, I have an idea. I said, what's your idea? He says, have you ever seen these big <coughs> vibrating tubs that you put the ceramic cones in and this detergent and we could just throw these rings in there and the machine would deeper the rings and you could fire Ralph. Now, why do you think Ronnie wanted Ralph fired? Do you think it's because Ronnie is really big on creating value for the shareholders? No. No. Uh, turns out Ralph had made a pass at Ronnie's wife at the company picnic. By the way, that's bad form, don't do that. Um, and so, uh, but Ronnie knew that his wife was a fairly smart woman and that she would not run off with a man who had no job. And so, what did, instead of trying to be a better husband, what does Ronnie do? <laughs> he tries to get Ralph fired. Okay, so um, I said, okay, well, let me see what we can do. And this is before the internet. Um, so I went and got the McMaster car catalog, which is a yellow book about this thing. And we found through it and we find all the stuff that we need to go. And at that time, uh, upfront cost for this whole thing was like 1,500 bucks. 1,500 bucks. Do you think I need to do a net present and now a net present value. No, it would have cost us $1,500 to do the analysis, right? Because it's some high dollar people's time. And so uh, instead what we do is pay back. Now, it's good because it's a small project and also it doesn't require any sort of special knowledge. I mean, Ronnie's a smart man. He, uh, he's a machinist, he can do trigonometry, which I would wager most of you cannot. Um, but he did not know anything about time value money. He didn't know how to run that TIBA 2 plus, but he could do this deal. And so I walked through with Ronnie and we did the payback together. And of course, it was quite easy to see. This thing pays back less than one year, right? Because we're saving Ralph's salary. Okay, now let's talk about how that story actually ends. We get the machine in, we get it set up, Ronnie is smiling from ear to ear. Why do you think Ronnie's smiling? Any ideas? He's tired of doing it one by one. Well, no, Ron, uh, Ronnie's job is actually getting a little bit harder now because he's going to have to fish these things out of the ceramic cones. But why? Why was it? What was his original goal in all of this? Was it to to get Ralph fired, right? And so Ronnie's like, yeah. He thinks Ralph's on his way out, and he says, okay, we've got this running now. What's going to happen to Ralph? I said, Ronnie, I've got some great news. We're not going to have to fire Ralph. After all, we had a retirement in another part of the plant, and Ralph's just going to go over there and work. Ronnie hasn't spoken to me since. <laughs> okay, so that is an example of a very simple, small project that this would be perfectly fine to. And often, it's going to lead to the same conclusion as NPV. In my example, I can't think of a discount rate high enough to have made that project negative NPV. So it's often going to lead to the same result. 
Now, remember earlier I told you when I was at Halliburton that people weren't willing to lend us money, they weren't willing to buy our stock, and so we had something called scarce capital. What does scarce mean? Mr. Green, what's scarce mean? Limited or few. Yeah, we've got a very little amount of capital, and in here it says lots of growth opportunities. We didn't have necessarily growth opportunities. What we had were opportunities for cost savings, just like the one that Ronnie was talking about. And so we had lots of opportunities, and uh, we, if we looked at positive NPV, the rule would have said accept everything. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the money to do that. And so instead, what we did was use payback. And we start off with what are called low-hanging fruit. You go and visit your grandfather. Your grandfather has an orchard out back, apples, beautiful, delicious apples. And he says, would you be a deer and go out and pick me an apple? You walk out into the orchard. Do you get the, or the apple from the highest point of the tree? No. What do you do? You grab the one that's the lowest that doesn't have a worm in it, because after all, you love your grandpa, right? So you grab the lowest one that doesn't have a worm in it. And so that's what we're doing here, is we're grabbing the low-hanging fruit. What are low-hanging fruit in industry? They are problems that we can quickly solve, sometimes with not that much capital investment. Once again, back to running. Okay, now, um, as we knock off all the stuff Let's say we knock off all the stuff with payback of two years or less. What do you think we do next? How about we change the arbitrary cutoff? Three years or less, right? We knock that stuff out, and then what do we do? Mr. Taylor, what do you think we do next? After we change the cutoff? Yeah, we go from two to three, and every, then we take care of everything that's three years or less. What do we do next? Oh my goodness, could we increase our arbitrary cutoff again? Yeah, Make it four years or less, right? We could do that. We could do that until we get to the point where we no longer have scarce capital. Does that make sense? Now, why is this good? If I'm forcing that uh, quick payback, what can I do with that money as it comes in? I can reinvest it, right? What if I invested in this in a very positive NPV project that wasn't going to produce cash flows for another 10 years? That'd be a bad deal, right? I mean, that's great for a company like Apple, and that's exactly what Apple does. I mean, how long have we been hearing about the Apple car? Have you guys even heard about the Apple car? It's supposed to be coming out, and it's been rumored for like 10 years now. The Apple Watch was rumored for a few years at least. They could do that. We couldn't. We didn't have the money. Okay. It also provides quicker feedback on managerial decision making. So, I'm going to do some poor art. Do we have any hockey players in here? No hockey players, okay. I should have recognized you all still have your teeth. Okay, so, this is my crummy artistic impersonation of a hockey stick. Why is this important? Well, you see the set of cash flows down here on the bottom? That's called a hockey stick projection. Hockey stick projection. Now, we're projecting our future cash flows, and what does this really say? It's like, well, you know, the cash flows aren't going to be that great, and here's one, two, and three, and then this is really going to take off. Why do you think people would provide a set of cash flows like that when doing net present value analysis? By the way, do they want the project to be accepted? Yes. Yeah. Why would they throw out a set of cash flows like this? To get accepted. Yeah, to get the project accepted. So what they're going to do is inflate years four, five, and six until that net present value goes positive so they can get the project accepted. Now, you know eventually they're going to get caught, right? So why do they go ahead and do this kind of thing? Well, it turns out the average amount of time an American manager stays on the job is three years, by which time they've got all this on their resume and they're on to the next job, right? Okay, so I worked with a guy named Dan and Dan did this. And I said, Dan, 
do you think honestly that your cash flows are going to look like that? He said, hell no. I said, why are you doing that? He's like, I'm going to get my project accepted. He says, besides at this place, they never come back and look. They never come back and look to see if our projects pay off. And he was right. He was right. Now, two years later, they started auditing things and Dan was, and, and it went retroactive. And so Dan was in hot water for a while. But this was what all of his projects looked like. And for the majority of time, when you see a, a, a projection like this, I want you to think of, and this may be one or two words, I'm not sure, maybe you can tell me. Bullshit, right? This is total, uh, let's, let's say horse hockey, you know, since we got the, the hockey stick here. I told a, a, a China EMBA class that one time, and they were all from steel corporations in China. And they, they looked concerned and they said, this is how all of our projects look. I said, you work with a bunch of liars. And they said, no, no, no. They said, this is how it works. When we build a new steel factory, in the beginning, we can only sell to the Chinese domestic automakers because the Japanese and the Germans both require a, a what's it called, a track record for the plant. And so they want to look at the output, the quality, all that over a long period before they're willing to give us contracts. And so over the first three years, our uh, steel output is low because we're just selling to the local uh, buyers. But then, after that, if we can prove that the quality is good, then we start to see these cash flows like you're showing here. I said, okay, this is the only example where I've ever heard this sort of thing make any sense. If you see this, what I want you to do is be suspicious and ask why. And if they can't give you a good answer, then you know it's crap, right? Now, if I had a payback of two years on this thing, we would know within two years whether or not this person's cash flows were right. Does that make sense? It gives us a much shorter time frame to, to know whether or not they're full of crap. Questions? So now let's talk about discounted payback. So remember earlier we said two things wrong with uh, payback. Well, there are three things wrong. Well, there are many things wrong, but two of the things we're concerned about are um, it doesn't take account of the time value of money, and it also doesn't it take into account the risk. And so some smart aleck came up with the idea that what we could do is for each of those cash flows, we could find the present value using a, a risk, a, a rate appropriate to the risk of those cash flows. And so this sounds like it solves those two problems, and it somewhat does, but it's still not getting us information regarding the wealth. And by the way, if we have that discount rate, now we can do NPV. Why would we do discounted payback when we could do NPV? Discounted payback still has some problems. For example, it doesn't take into account the cash flows that happen after payback. And so, uh, once again, it's just not a good measure. It reminds me of a dish my mom used to make. Uh, my mom would take ground beef, crackers, eggs, <coughs> and ketchup. And I like all four of those things by themselves. But then she would do something truly horrific with those things. Any ideas what she did? Mix them. So mix them. And what's the dish that came out as a result? Mr. Green, you look like a man that might know. Meatloaf, I'd say. Meatloaf! By the way, there's always going to be like, so raise your hand if you like meatloaf. There's always two or three. Yeah. Okay, so there's one. And you probably got a couple of people who are too shy to admit. And that's fine. And then afterwards, Ms. Wabi will probably come up to me and say, you just haven't had it the right way. And I'll say, no, there is no right way. Okay, back to the story. She took some truly wonderful things and she turned them into garbage. So that's what discounted payback does. It takes some truly wonderful things and it turns them into garbage, something that is less than the sum of the ingredients. Now, will I be asking you to calculate discounted payback for homework or exam? Absolutely not. As long as you can promise me that you can make the meatloaf speech if your boss ever asks you to use this dog with fleas. Probably the most, the, the thing you're all writing down is will not be on this. 
Okay, now we're on to average accounting return, or AAR. And AAR is calculated as the average project earnings after taxes and depreciation divided by the average book value of investment over the life of the project. It turns out the only thing accountants love more than numbers are words because they've thrown a lot of them here. And, and finance people look at this and say, wait a minute, isn't that just average net income divided by average book value? And the accountants say, yes. Right? It just does, it doesn't sound as, as, as sophisticated. So that's what we're really looking at here. And if you're going to write something down on your note sheet, which I tell you you should, it's average net income divided by the average book value. So what do we need? We need projected accounting earnings. And so accounting earnings are like net income, net income for the project. We need the investment amount and a depreciation schedule. Why do we need a depreciation schedule? For two reasons. Number one, remember we said average book value? The way we get book value is historical costs minus the accumulated depreciation. So that's why one reason we have to have depreciation schedule. Number two, in order to calculate net income, basically you've got to have the depreciation schedule or the depreciation. So both of those reasons come into play there. And then finally, a minimum acceptable AAR, which is an arbitrary cutoff. Another arbitrary cutoff, but this time, instead of being coming from the VP of Manufacturing or the VP of Operations, it's likely going to come from your firm's comptroller. What's a comptroller? Chapter one, folks. What does a comptroller do? Uh, the com They're like the head of the economy. Yeah, they're the, they're the top accountant, right? So they're the ones that are going to be trotting out this, this cutoff. Now, we call it arbitrary because it is not derived through market measures. We know when we look at a required return, chapter 12 is all about finding a required return, and we use the markets as a laboratory to tell us what this number should be. <coughs> there is no laboratory to find this minimum AAR. And by the way, our, our rule is to accept all projects with AAR greater than or equal to. This one's, this is different than NPV, right? It's greater than or equal to the minimum AAR. Now, one thing I want to tell you before we jump into this example is that the initial investment is $500,000. The initial investment is $500,000. And I'll always give you that. The initial investment is $500,000. Okay, so they tell us revenues, expenses, they give us the before tax cash flow, depreciation, um, earnings after earnings before taxes, taxes. They give us everything we need to calculate that income. In fact, they calculate it for us. So that's pretty cool. We can go ahead and then take those and add them together and divide by five to get our average net income. In this case, our average net income is $50,000. The average net income is 50,000 bucks. Now, the average investment is a little trickier. By the way, remember we said it's the average book value. The book value at time zero is the same as that as your initial investment. It's the same as the initial investment because it's historical cost minus accumulated depreciation. The historical cost is $500,000. How much depreciation have we had at time zero? None. And so that's why our book value at time zero is $500,000. And we are using a straight line depreciation over the life of the project. By the way, it's not your project. We're using straight line depreciation over the life of the project. What is annual depreciation on $500,000 over five years, straight line. That's just 100,000 bucks, right? And so how do we find time one? We take the historical cost, 500,000 minus the accumulated depreciation, which is now $100,000, gives us $400,000. Now, to move on to the next year, we could say that it's the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation, historical cost of 500,000, minus the accumulated depreciation of 200,000 gives us 300,000, but I'm gonna tell you an easier way. 
I look at the depreciation from last year and then subtract, or the, the book value from last year and subtract this year's depreciation. And that gives me this year's book value. And that's also much easier to do in an Excel spreadsheet. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you to do. Look at last year's book value, subtract out this year's depreciation, that gives you this year's book value. And so the book value at time two is 300,000, at time three is 200,000, at time four is 100,000, and at time five is zero. We're gonna add all those together and divide by Five is what we all want to say, but here's the problem. How many book values do we actually have up there? Six. 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 And the reason we do, remember for the net income, we just have one, two, three, four, five. Year one, two, three, four, five. Here we also have times zero. So we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. So that's why we're dividing by six. That trips people up all the time. Okay. Now, that gives us an average investment of a quarter million. But I'm going to tell you an easier way to get there. If we are straight line depreciating to zero, and that's the only case in which this is true. If we are depreciating straight line over the life down to zero, it turns out that the average investment is merely one half, or the, yeah, the average investment is merely one half the initial investment. Let me say that one more time. If we are straight line depreciating over the life of the project to zero, then the average investment is merely one half the initial investment. And you'll probably even see that in a solution to a problem and wonder why they did that. Well, now you know. If it's straight line depreciated to zero over the life of the project, the average is merely one half of the initial investment. Okay. Now, what a, uh, there's a footnote on here, and then I'll, I'll talk about that, and then we'll go ahead and calculate AAR. Notice it says uh, in year five there is negative taxes. Do negative taxes exist in the real world? Is the government ever going to write you a check for money losses at your business? No. And so what does that mean? What, if we had no other source of income whatsoever, then we might consider a tax loss carry forward and all that stuff. That's accounting stuff. I'm not concerned about it. Here's what I'm going to tell you is we always assume that a project is in addition to the business of an already profitable firm. We always assume that a project is in addition to the business of an already profitable firm. So what does that mean? It means that minus 16,667 in taxes we were going to have to pay 46667 and now we're only going to have to pay 30000 right? And so that's why it's acceptable to have negative tax cash flows in your projects because we assume that it's just part of a bigger, more profitable company. Okay, let's figure AAR and let's assume that the, uh, so by the way, 50000 over 250000 is 20%. Let's assume the minimum acceptable AAR was 15%. Wouldn't we accept the project? Yeah, because it's greater than, right? What if we said the minimum AAR was 25%? What would we do? Ms. Mena says? Reject. Reject. What if, it had, uh, what if our, our minimum AAR was exactly 20%? What would we do? You accept it because the rule is greater than or equal to. Remember, greater than or equal to. And so that's how we use AAR. Now let's ask ourselves the three questions about AAR. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? Any ideas? Remember how we found the average net income? We threw all that crap into the same pot and divided by five. Did we treat the period one net income any different? No! So we didn't account for time value money, and I'll tell you this. It doesn't even work with real cash flows. Are accounting cash flows, or are, are this, is this accounting stuff real cash flows? No, there's all sorts of non-expense or non-cash expense weirdness going on here. Um, depreciation isn't a, re uh, lots of stuff going on here. 
Okay, number two, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Not in any meaningful way. You might run into an account and they would say, oh, well, we require a higher AAR for steer projects. And I would say, that's great. Tell me how you went and scientifically determined what that uh, riskier minimum AAR is. And they never can tell me because the number is arbitrary. It's always just been pulled out of thin air. Okay, so it does not account for the riskiness of the cash flows. And finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Any ideas? Mr. Taylor, what do you think? I say no. He says no, and he's absolutely right. He says he is absolutely right. We don't know whether this thing is, uh, is improving shareholder wealth or destroying it. We have no idea. So how many stars should we give AAR? Zero. 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 This is a dog with fleas. So why do people still use AAR? Well, first of all, the numbers are readily available and people are lazy. Let me give you an example. By the way, when I say the numbers are readily available, let me tell you about my accountant, Jack. Jack was the only guy in the business unit that had, he, he had no social contact. The rest of us were in an office with someone else and we also had windows where we could look outside. So Jack's office was, <laughs> Uh, it was, I think it was a converted room closet. It had no windows and it was just big enough for Jack and his spreadsheets. And uh, then that was it. And so how could you make Jack's day? You go by and you say, hey Jack, I need some numbers. And this is Jack's response. Because <laughs> Jack is so happy to do numbers, right? That's what Jack lives for. And so I would say, you know, here's, here's what's going on. And he's like, yeah, I'll get that for you. I'm lazy. I'm going to let Jack do that work, right? And then I can use those numbers to do my AAR. So that's uh, reason number one. Is that a good reason? No. Okay, number two, it's easy to calculate. Now we said earlier that uh, payback was easy to calculate, so that gave it some merit. But uh, in this case, we're gonna see that so the payback has some real usefulness to it. This thing, where it really doesn't. Now, the next one, here is one that starts perhaps to hold water, and that is that stockholders and the media pay attention to accounting returns, things like ROE and ROA. And so AAR is related uh, through its emphasis on net income and assets. By the way, if I take net income divided by total assets, that gives me return on assets. And so what we've basically done, the AAR that we've calculated is the return on assets for a single project. And so you might say, well, wait a minute, if we're trying to accomplish a, a baseline ROA at the firm, we should say basically accept anything with an ROA higher than the firm's ROA, and therefore uh, the ROA at the firm will just keep getting higher and higher as a result of accepting these projects. <coughs> What's the problem? Does anyone see the problem with that kind of idea? I'll give, I'll give you a hint. Do you think all the projects are equally risky? No. All the projects are not equally risky. Replacing the company pickup truck, fairly safe. Um, building a pipeline to send beer underneath the desert between the U.S. and Mexico, pretty risky. Pretty risky. By the way, do you think that's been done? If you ever, have any of you ever had Corona beer? That stuff is brewed in a brewery in Mexico, and it's actually piped over the border and then bottled in the U.S. That explains the taste. It does. Yeah, so it, you don't know what's going on in that pipeline area, except for I'll tell you this, it's hot, right? Because it's the desert in this Mexico. Back to the story. AAR, so if let's say that the pipeline deal, it's going to have a high ROA, but is it going to be high enough to rewards for the risk that we're taking? We have no idea. We just have no idea. So we're going to say that one's a bad one, even though people will make that argument. And then finally, sometimes your boss is an accountant. When I first went to work at Halliburton, the boss was a former operations guy named Al Baker, and we never heard anything about this average accounting return. But then eventually we get a new CEO, a man named Dave Lassar, and Dave Lassar came to us from our accounting, our accountant, Arthur Anderson. 
And then after Dave Lassar shows up, we start to see demands for us to calculate average accounting return. Why? The boss was an accountant. Okay, so let's assume that you're working for uh, an accountant and you already know this thing is a dog with fleas, right? And your boss says, you need to examine this project and if it provides an AAR of at least 20%, we're gonna do it. So if you go out and find that it has an AAR of 25%, the very next thing you should do is to calculate the NPV. And if the NPV is positive, you go back to your boss and you say, boss, you're a genius. Average accounting return of 25%, let's do the project. And your boss says, yay. Now, what if it comes back less than 20%? Then you do the NPV, and if the NPV is also negative, the talk's very similar. Boss, we shouldn't do the project. AAR is lower than 20%. And you, you both hang your heads for a couple of, for a, a moment of silence, and then you move on with your lives. But what if the AAR says to accept the project, but the NPV says reject the project? Here's what you do. You say, well, boss, I did this. AAR is 25%, but I went ahead and did an NPV on this thing, and it turns out this thing is going to destroy shareholder value to the tune of $57,000. And your boss says, AAR, 25%, we proceed. What do you do? Yes, sir. And then I go back to my desk. And this is back in the day when we didn't have, you know, things like notes on iPhones and all that. I actually had a log book that I kept in my lower right hand drawer where I recorded bad behavior on part of my employees and on my bosses, right? And so this one I wrote down. Today Bob asked me to do an AAR analysis. I did it. AAR was 25% but I found that this was going to destroy shareholder value to the tune of $57,000. I told Bob, Bob told me not to worry about it. I shut the book, I put it in my drawer, and I wait. What am I waiting for? You're right. The investigation, right? <laughs> the investigation, the accountants show up. They're like, we see your name on this project paperwork here, Haggard. That project sucked. Why did you do that? And I say, <clears throat> and I pull out, and I read to them from my law book. I say, would you like me to make a copy for you? And they say, yes, and I make a copy. And then what do you think is likely to happen after that? Who are they going to go talk to next? Bob! And what's likely to come out of that conversation? Bob might get fired. I might get his job, right? Yeah, you never know. At the very least, Bob and I are going to have a contentious relationship going forward, but at least I kept my job, right? Okay, now, so what am I telling you? It's better to be employed than to be correct, unless there is some sort of ethical issue involved. Does that make sense? So I'll give you an example. I was, uh, we were making parts and I had come out of a world of where we machined and heat treated things, so I knew how metal reacted to heat. And these folks had never done that, and they were making these axles. And they were using inertial welding to stick these two spindles on the ends of the axles. And so it got really hot, and then uh, they would just spray water on it to cool it down, and then they would machine it smooth. And so these actually being made at another one of our facilities. They were coming into my facility. I am also the quality assurance manager. And so I know, hey, wait a minute. There's a good possibility these things are gonna be cracked because they're not going about this the right way. And so I actually, I had signature approval up to $10,000. I could spend $10,000 without being asked a single question about why I was doing it. And so I bought the equipment and I have my guys trained to do what's called magnetic particle inspection to look for these cracks. We found these cracks, and I ended up quarantining 
the whole lot. Everybody knows not what quarantine means now from an epidemic standpoint. Quarantine and manufacturing means we're not gonna let these things out of the plant. I'm not gonna put them in a product. They are stacked over there until someone with more power than me decides what to do. I get a phone call. It's the director of operations. He's two levels up from me in the operation. He says, Haggard, get up here. Unfortunately, I was at a plant connected to the company headquarters. So I had to trot my butt up to the headquarters building and I went in to see him. He says, what are you doing with my axles? And I said, your axles are cracked. Now, at this point, he should have been, <gasps> right? Instead, what does he say? How do you know? I'm like, well, I bought the equipment and trained my guys because I was pretty sure this was gonna happen. Now, he's still missing out here. I said, look, here's what you need to know. Fatigue failure, when these things get to going down the road and the wheels are vibrating like going over expansion joints, eventually those cracks, that's gonna fail there and the wheel's gonna come off the truck and it's gonna go sailing down the highway and it's gonna go down the median and jump into the oncoming traffic and kill Ma and Pa Kettle coming the other direction in the pickup truck. That's what's gonna happen. And he says, mm -hmm. is okay. So I go away. But do you know that was the beginning of the end of my relationship with that company, right? Because they had it out for me and I knew I didn't want to work for them anymore. So there are occasions upon which it is better to be correct than to be employed. But when we're just talking about $57,000, and by the way, you could be wrong because remember, MPD is a swag. Does that all make sense? Okay. Next, we're going to talk about the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return, or IRR, is the discount rate that makes the NPV of a project zero. You should go ahead and write that, circle that, and, and put the note sheet next to it. Circle that and write the note sheet next to it. And the reason I'm telling you that is that something will come up during the exam and that definition you will find very helpful. So I'll go ahead and put that on your note sheet. Now the rule is to accept all projects with an IRR greater than the appropriate discount rate. It turns out that this is exactly the same rate we use for NPV. It's exactly the same rate we use for NPV. And so what we're really saying here is that uh, if we've got an IRR on the project that is greater than that, then it has basically cleared that hurdle rate. You'll hear people talk about the hurdle rate. And uh, if the cash flows are not weird, if, and we'll talk about what weird looks like, but if they're not weird, then that project will have a positive NPV. So what do we need for IRR? Well, we need the initial investment amount, we need the future cash flows and their timing, and we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. By the way, these are the same things that we need for NPV. And so you might expect that I'm gonna tell you something about meatloaf here, but I'm not. Because we're gonna see that much like payback, IRR does have some usefulness, IRR does have a place. So here is our very simple IRR example. You have a project that's gonna pay $110 a year from today for an investment of $100 today. What's the IRR? Well, we are going to set up our NPV equation. Now remember our NPV, we've got our initial cash flow plus the present value of all the cash flows subsequent to the initial investment. And that 110 divided by one plus R would be the present value of the cash flow at time one. And now I'm gonna remember that definition, that the IRR is the rate that makes NPV equal to zero. And so what I'm gonna do is set this thing equal to zero and then solve for R. And in this case, it's really easy to do. And it's 10%. So if our discount rate was 8%, we would accept this project. If our discount rate were 12%, we would reject this. Now let's take a look at IRR. It says, IRR greater than the appropriate discount rate. What if the appropriate discount rate here was 10%? What would we do? 
we reject it because after all, we said to reject NPV equals zero projects. And if the discount rate and the IRR are the same, the IRR is the rate that makes the NPV zero, right? Okay. So you say, wow, this is pretty easy. But it's really not that simple. And here's why. Because we have, let's say it goes on for three years. So that's present value of cash flow at time one, present value of cash flow at time two, cash present value of cash flow at time three. I have a PhD in finance and I had to take a boatload of math as an engineering undergrad and in uh, finance PhD school, whatever you call that. Um, I can't solve that for R. I can't solve that for R. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Volkova, she's probably the only person here that has better mathematic education than I do. Do you know how to solve this thing for R? No, no. So what do we end up doing? You have to use something called iteration. Iteration is just repeated guessing. And so what do you do? Well, I guess in R, and if this thing comes out negative, I know I've guessed my R too large. And so I make my guess of R smaller. And I keep going back and forth until I find an R that makes this thing relatively close to zero. That's called iteration. Now, do you think I would be so cruel as to do that to you in an exam? Absolutely not. In fact, that's the reason that your TIBA2 Plus has an IRR button, because your calculator is much better at guessing than you are. Now, just to make you all grateful that you did not go to engineering school, I actually had to do stuff like this during heat transfer exams, where you, and your first guess could determine whether or not you actually were able to solve the problem, right? Because if you were too far afield, now you're having you're swinging really wide. Would you think that, what would students today say about a problem like that on an exam? It's abuse. It's abuse, that's not fair. Do you know what the response was? Tough. You can finish out for me there. Yeah. Okay. Now, so you can feel good. Now, it's a good. It's a reason to love your TIBA two plus even more. And so, what are we going to do next time? We are going to talk through some examples. So be sure to be here.